All right, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. So despite what the Extension School's website might tell you, my name is Tommy McWilliam, and I will be your instructor for the semester. So if you're sitting here, there's a good chance that you use a computer most every day. But you might not fully understand what goes on when you turn on the computer or connect to the internet or download a streaming movie. So the goal really of this course is, as the description says, to take the hood off computers and really start to understand exactly what's going on when you use them. So our goals are twofold. One, conceptually, to understand what's happening inside of the computer. And two, more practical, so try to understand how to set up a home network or how to uh, edit graphics with multimedia programs. And so throughout the course, we'll try to uh, build both of these together. So let's start uh, this lecture with a story. So this is the story of what happens when your computer turns on. And we're looking at this not because this is an amazing, fantastic process, so it's very interesting, but really as kind of a tour of what is on the inside of your computer and how all of these various hardware components start to work together. So our story begins. It's 9 in the morning. You hit the power button on your computer, and a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen as your screen starts to light up and come to life. So all of your computer components are connected to something that looks like this. And this is called a motherboard. And the motherboard's job is to coordinate all of the various pieces of hardware that go into making your computer run. So the first thing that's going to happen when you press the power button is something called the power supply is going to kick in. So as you might expect, the power supply's job is to take all the current coming from your wall when you plug it into the wall outlet convert that into some voltage that it can send throughout your computer. So this is really, as you might expect, what's going to power your computer. So the power supply also has usually a series of fans. And the goal of these fans is to circulate air out of your computer so that nothing overheats. So if we jump back to the motherboard, we can see that the power supply is plugged into this thing up here, the power connector. Whoop. So right up here, the 24-pin power connector. So this is where the power supply is going to plug in to your motherboard. So now that your computer has power, it needs to somehow know what to do with it. Right? We can't just plug something in and all of a sudden expect our computer to be able to connect to the internet and watch cat videos. So the goal of the BIOS, or the basic input-output system, is to tell your computer what to do as soon as it has power. So this really plays a crucial role in the setup of your computer. Right? This is the first instructions that your computer needs to execute in order to turn on. So if we look at the picture again, the BIOS is located up here in the top right. So we see this little flash chip, and we'll learn more about what that means later. But all the instructions that, are that explain to your computer how to start up and how to get going are actually contained on this entirely separate chip, because this is so super important. So what does the BIOS do? The first thing it's going to need to do is it needs to read some settings about your computer, maybe what time it is or some other information about the various hardware components that are connected. And to do that, it's going to read from something called the CMOS. And this stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. So if you're looking for the impressive sounding acronym of the day, this is it. And so this is where things like your system's date and time are stored. And so the BIOS is going to read from this uh, in order to get some basic information. So it's really important uh, that this information isn't lost if your computer loses power or you turn it off. So it turns out that this information is actually powered by its own separate battery, uh, which is really nice. It's a little lithium battery uh, that's not unlike uh, what you might see in a watch. So here on our motherboard again, right here in the middle, is our little CMOS battery. And this is what makes sure that our computer doesn't lose these super important settings uh, when it turns on and off. So we can also change these settings, much like you can change the time in your computer. The data that's stored inside of the CMOS is not uh, by any means permanent. So the next thing that BIOS is going to do once it reads these basic settings is it's going to perform a series of tests to make sure that your hardware is working correctly. Because you know, if we have something like a faulty component on our motherboard, we don't want to continue the startup process because our computer is not going to work. So the first thing it's going to test is to make sure that our video is working correctly. Right? And so in order to display anything helpful to you, our computer needs to somehow know how to fill in the pixels on your screen. And in doing so, be able to display perhaps some helpful error message. So the computer's graphics card is a little piece of hardware uh, that's in charge of writing all of this output to the screen. So your graphics card might connect uh, via one of these things over here. So these are PCI slots on the right side here. So these PCI slots are designed uh, to give your motherboard some more expandability. 
So right now, your motherboard has, as you can see, all these different components built in. But there's a good chance that you probably want to extend your motherboard with something like a graphics card or even a flash drive. So slots like the PCI slot make this totally expandable. And so you might want to add a new graphics card or even a new sound card, and it could plug into one of those slots over on the right here. So next to it is also this thing called the PCI Express. This is basically just a newer version of the PCI slot. It's, it's faster, it's better, um, we all, but some other boards might also have these older slots for kind of legacy hardware. So the newest kind of graphics cards uh, might plug into something called an AGP port, uh, which is not pictured here. Um, but does anyone happen to know of any graphics cards brands? There are kind of two major ones out there. Does anyone know of any? Yeah, so ATI or NVIDIA. And these are two kind of uh, competing companies. And these are two manufacturers whose job is really just to make these things that power your graphics. So things like high performance gaming or other things like that will probably want some dedicated graphics card to make sure that your computer is getting the performance that you want. All right, so after we've made sure uh, that our graphics cards are working, and here's just what a graphics card could look like, over here on the right, uh, you can see these little yellow strips. And this is exactly where it's going to plug into the motherboard. So you can see here that this would kind of fit into one of those slots over to the right where we were looking. So then we're going to continue our series of tests. And these are now going to be called the POST, so the uh, Power On Self Test. So the motherboard is going to test itself. So unfortunately, if you're reading around, you might see these referred to as POST tests, uh, which happens to stand for the Power On Self Test Tests. So it's one of those acronyms like ATM machine, which is automated transaction machine machine, or pin number, personal identification, number, number. Um, so when we hear POST, we're actually referring to this actual series of tests. So the next thing we're going to test is the computer's memory. So your computer's memory uh, is stored in this thing called RAM, which stands for random access memory. And you may have seen this term you know, as you're shopping for a computer. You see your computer has some amount of RAM. So your computer's RAM is it's basically its short-term memory. So when you have a, a program running, like Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, that program needs to store data somewhere, whether it be temporarily downloading the images on a website or remembering what website you're currently browsing. It's going to do so in RAM. And so typically, your computer has between 2 and 4 gigabytes of RAM. So it's not really doesn't make sense to store something like your entire movie collection in RAM. That will be stored somewhere else. So the amount of memory you have helps determine how many programs, for example, you can run at once. Right? If I have Google Chrome that wants about a gig of RAM, and I have Microsoft Word that wants another gig of RAM, eventually I'm going to have more, uh, more programs that want more RAM than I have. So uh, by basically upgrading our RAM or increasing the amount of RAM in our computer, that's going to help us do more things at once. So this is helpful for multitasking. So RAM uh, is stored in sticks of memory. So here in our motherboard, up on the top left, uh, you can see these four slots for memory. And so our little RAM looks like this. So this was taken out of a desktop computer, a very old one. So this is about 256 megabytes of RAM, which is not a lot by any stretch of the imagination. You can see here that this would fit nicely into my desktop motherboard up on the top left slots there. So your laptop, on the other hand, might have a much smaller motherboard and might have smaller RAM. So they'll come in different sizes. And this is a stick of RAM that might plug into a smaller computer. As you can see, it's just smaller um, than the one that I held up. OK, so now your computer says, all right, I can display things to the screen. I'm able to save things in my short-term memory. So Google Chrome's going to be pretty happy with me. The next thing I want to do is determine if there are any peripherals plugged into the computer. So a peripheral is just any external hardware that you might plug into one of the ports on the outside of your computer. So what are some peripherals or some hardware that you plug into your computer most every day? What's that? Yeah, so a thumb drive. So that's great. So a thumb drive is much like I have here, a little Mario head, is a little piece of external flash memory that you can plug into your computer and give it some more storage. So that's one. What else might you plug into your computer as a peripheral? Yeah, a printer. So that's great. So a printer is the same way. So you're going to plug that into some port that you can reach. You, know, you don't have to take apart your computer and plug it into one of the motherboard's PCI slot. This is something that you can actually reach and plug in. So a printer, anything else come to mind? Yeah, mouse and keyboard. Great. Some other very helpful things to using a desktop computer. So these are all the things that the post is now going to make sure are plugged in and functioning correctly. So this motherboard here has a bunch of spaces to plug things into down at the bottom here. So over all the way to the right, we have a series of circular ports. So what might those be? What's that? So down over, sorry, on the, the rightmost side here. So that, that column of six different yellow circles. 
Yeah, so this is our audio ports. So this includes things like a speaker, maybe a microphone, maybe a line in so you can plug you know, your MP3 player into your computer or maybe like a guitar amp into your computer. Um, so we're not too concerned with those. So to the left of those now, this topmost one, it looks kind of like a phone jack, but not quite because it's a little bit bigger. This is an Ethernet port. And this is where you can connect your computer to a modem or a Wi-Fi router, as we'll see in a couple lectures, and basically give your computer internet access. So below that, and to the column to the left of that, these are USB ports. And USB ports are probably what you've used the most uh, when you're buying any consumer electronics. So as you saw before, a thumb drive very likely plugs in via USB. So pictured here uh, is just one type of USB slot uh, on the motherboard. But it turns out that USB, even though we just commonly call them USB cables, they actually come in a whole wide variety of shapes. So this top left one is probably what we're most used to seeing. If we buy a SanDisk flash drive at Best Buy, it's probably a USB-A connector. However, if we buy a printer, it probably looks more like that port over on the top right, which is the USB-B. So the basic idea behind this is that we can have a cable with two different types of connectors. So if I'm a computer maker and I want to allow you to plug in anything with USB into my computer, I'm just going to say I'm going to give you a USB-A port. So now if I'm a device maker, you know, like a printer, for example, and I decide, well, I think that USB port would just look a lot better on the side of my hardware. What I can do is just provide a cable that has a USB-B port on one side and USB-A slot on the other side. So, we can ha so there's no incompatibility between A and B. They're just two different shapes of things uh, that fit into your computer. So how about these bottom ones here? So we have USB mini. There's also USB micro. What might plug into one of those? Yeah, so a cell phone. So this is really, really common. Uh, a lot of new smartphones in particular are starting to standardize on charger ports, which is really, really great. So I still have, uh, admittedly, one of these. So a nice little normal smartphone. So on the problem set one form, I ask, you know, what kind of, what kind of phone do you have? So don't feel guilty if you have a normal phone, because I'm among you. And when I was first buying this and all the phones previous to it, each one had their own stupid charger. And so every time I got a new phone, I'd have to either get a new charger, or if I lost my charger, I would have to buy another one. I couldn't just use my charger from my old phone. But luckily, now that we're starting to standardize on this USB, on this USB type connector, suddenly I can just go and use my friend's charger or something like that. So this is a, a fantastic thing. Uh, anything else that might plug in with the uh, USB micro or mini? Yeah, so digital cameras. And so what might be the motivation? So why might my digital camera want to use this USB mini instead of my, say, USB B? If I'm a camera maker, why might I want that? What's that? Yeah, exactly. So now that'll allow me to plug in my cam uh, camera to my hard drive. But what, may, what might make me choose USB mini in particular? Yeah, size. So right. So if I'm, if I'm Nikon, and I have Ashton Kutcher or whoever he promotes, and he's promoting my really cool, thin, sexy camera, I don't really want this big, gigantic port coming out the side of it. So I might choose USB micro um, just because of its size limitations. And again, there's nothing fundamentally incompatible with all of these different types of USB connectors. And that's uh, what's great about having a cable with two different sides to it. So uh, up next, on the left here, all the way to the left, it looks like we have some different slots here. So the top, the top pink slot and then the bottom left one are respectively parallel and serial ports, uh, which used to be uh, ways to transfer data uh, to a printer or something like that. But they're kind of fallen out of vogue right now. There are much more faster and newer ports available. Much anything that you used to plug into one of these ports is now USB enabled, except for this one here in the bottom right. And this is what's called a VGA port. So does anyone happen to know what plugs into that? Yeah, a monitor. So a VGA port is used to transfer display data from your computer, whether it be a desktop or a laptop, and transfer that to a monitor. So VGA is just one way of hooking up some kind of external display to your computer. So if you've recently bought a DVD player or a Blu-ray player, you probably connected it to your television using something like this. And this is called an HDMI cable. An HDMI cable is kind of a newer, faster way of transferring data, you know, in particular HD graphics data or movie data. And it's designed to be much faster than something like VGA. So an HDMI connector is entirely digital. So that means that anything you send along this cable is either a 0 or a 1. So a VGA, on the other hand, is analog. And it's more than just zeros and 1s. So if you bought a computer monitor that didn't have an HDMI uh, connector, if you purchased it somewhat recently, it may have a connector that looks something like this. And this is called a DVI cable, or Digital Video Interface. And DVI, much like HDMI, is also digital. 
It's newer, and it's sending along only zeros and ones. However, there's a drawback here with DVI, and that if you've ever you know, got your desktop computer or your laptop and you hooked up your monitor and then started playing a song, you may have noticed that the sound is still coming out of your closed laptop sitting inside of your desk instead of your fancy speaker system. So DVI actually has to have this separate audio connector, much like my computer has now, and while uh, HDMI, on the other hand, can transfer audio and video. So that's why if you hooked up your Blu-ray player, there's a good chance you didn't need to plug in some separate audio thing. So finally, uh, VGA looks like this. Again, we'll need a separate audio channel, and this is all analog. And so this is a little bit antiquated technology, but still in use all the time. Um, many projectors, for example, uh, use VGA in order to output data. So if you have a MacBook, on the other hand, uh, you'll probably have something that looks like this. So when your PC maker is making a PC, and they have to basically decide, do I want to output HDMI, do I want to output DVI, do I want to output VGA? And they'll typically just put one of those ports on the side of their computer. So for one reason or another, Apple decided that they didn't want to do that. Think different. So instead, they decided to put one of these little tiny things on the side of their computer. So this used to be called a mini display port. And kind of an old a MacBook that you purchased before 2012 probably has a mini display port. Now they're called the Thunderbolt port. It's the same port, just a little faster, I guess. So basically, in order to connect to some third party DVI or VGA, you need to purchase one of these things, which typically runs you between $20 and $30 uh, just to use some external hardware. If you buy an Apple monitor, on the other hand, it'll probably plug right into your Apple hardware. So they had to become the most valuable company in the world somehow. So just a slight tangent. So let's say you just bought your new, brand new TV or your brand new Blu-ray player. And the guy at Best Buy said to you, well, you don't forget, you need to buy some kind of cable to plug in your Blu-ray player. And you know, you kind of walk around the aisle, and you see on one hand these nice $10 six-foot cables, and then you see in the other aisle with this flashy display sign, uh, these nice cables here. So I just went to Best Buy and I searched, uh, bestbuy.com, and I searched HDMI cable. And then I just said, I want to sort from the highest price to the lowest price. Turns out I can actually buy a $500 HDMI cable. I don't know why you'd need that, because there's no, these things here, even though they're platinum plated and they're made of diamonds and they do your homework for you, they don't actually do anything. Right? Remember we said that HDMI is digital. That means that everything we send along this cable is either a 0 or a 1. So my 0 on a $10 HDMI cable is no better than your 0 on a diamond encrusted HDMI table, cable. It's just a 0 or a 1. There's nothing I can do to make that 0 better. So one of the goals of this course really is to make you more informed in the tech world and kind of avoid these things like uh, confirmation bias. You know, this cable is more expensive, so it has to be better. And so here I have a quick video of perhaps some people running into the same trap. So this was featured on Jimmy Kimmel pretty recently, and I will let this speak for itself. It is kind of funny how people react when the new iPhone comes out. Some people actually get mad. Why would they make another product? I desperately want to buy those bastards. It's almost as if the new iPhone somehow ruins the old iPhone, but it doesn't. It's, it's all in your head. In fact, we set a camera out on the street today. And we told people outside to check out the new iPhone 5, which is unavailable so far. So in reality, they were, what they were looking at is the current iPhone 4S that everyone has. <laughs> and well, here's how that experiment played out. The new iPhone 5 just came out today. We want to know if you'll take a look at it. Tell us how it compares to the last iPhone. I'd love to. Oh, it's way better. Yeah, it's nice. That's definitely noticeably better. It's a little, a little thinner. Looks like the screen's a little bigger. Seems a little bit faster. Yeah. Faster, lighter. Feels uh, heavier. Feels heavier? I think so. A lot lighter than the last one. It's a lot faster as well. Mine's going to take forever. So this one's faster? Yeah, definitely faster. Right on. Oh, it looks very nice. Very nice, very updated. Oh, my God. It feels a lot lighter and just more, um, just a lot higher quality. And it's got, um, if you drop it, it looks like it's not going to break. Like this one has a million times. The screen is clear, HD. Colors are brighter. Oh, it has a video front and back? Mm -hmm. Video front and back? That's cool. This doesn't have that. So you like it better than the last one? Yeah, I have the 4S. Yeah? Yeah. I'm always open for a new phone. <laughs> well, it's the, uh, the emperor's new phone. So just to recap, they were all holding the exact same phone uh, that the new person was, that the interviewer was holding there. 
So there's also uh, this cute graphic here uh, from the Mint.com blog. So if unfamiliar, uh, Mint.com is a company that was recently acquired by the people who make uh, software like TurboTax. So the goal of this uh, blog here is to give you some nice uh, money-saving tips. And so they have down here, after a very nice technical explanation, this fun fact here uh, that if you buy this cable here, this brand that happens to cost $250, it's actually cheaper to wire up your TV using solid 14 karat gold. And so to be clear, I'm not recommending that easy either. Uh, but just keep in mind uh, that you really don't need to spend as much money on these things uh, as you might want. So we have here uh, a nice flow chart describing uh, you and your purchasing. Do you rely on consumer products to add value to your self-worth and image? Do you have more money than you can possibly spend? And then it gets to things that I don't want to say on camera. So point of the story here is just try to th you know, make sure you think about what is actually being advertised in these products uh, that claim to be so much better than their competitors. OK, so tie rate over. Uh, let's go back to our story, where our computer is just in the process of turning on still. So we've tested our video card. It's good to go. We've tested our memory. It's good to go. We've looked at all of our peripherals. We know the flash drives that are plugged in, if we're connected to any printers or anything like that. So now, finally, we're, we're done. We're testing all of our hardware. We're good to go. We're going to start moving forward with actually turning the computer on into something that you can use. So the first thing that BIOS needs to do is it needs to load your operating system off of the hard drive. So if before we looked at RAM and memory, and we called that your computer's short-term memory, the hard drive is more of its long-term storage. So where RAM has something like between 2 and 4 gigabytes, your hard drive typically has hundreds of gigabytes of space. So this is where all of your movies and your music collection will actually be stored. So your hard drive nowadays might take several forms. So here, this motherboard, it actually supports connections to two different types of hard drives. So in the top right, we see these things called SATA connectors. And there are four little ports. And this is what one of your, a newer hard drive is going to plug into. So to the left of this, we have these other ports called the IDE, or it might also call them PETA or ATA. And these are the little 18-inch ribbon cables uh, that you may have seen. And these are what are going to connect kind of older hard drives uh, into your computer. So notice here that your motherboard has slots for hypothetically six hard drives. So what are some reasons you might want that? Yeah, so you might just want to have more storage, right? You have, might have a huge movie collection, or you're digitizing you know, all of your family photos. You might just need more space than your computer came with. What are some other reasons we might want more hard drives? Yeah, so that's great. So as a backup, so let's say that I'm using my computer, and all of a sudden, I get a hard drive failure. And even though that's devastating, it's not all too uncommon, um, since the hard drive has, uh, one of the older hard drives has a ton of moving parts. So the possibility for mechanical failure is actually pretty high. So if one of those hard drives fails, what we could want is to have some backup drive. So using a technology you may have heard of called RAID, what I can do is I can actually set up my computer to say, I want this second hard drive plugged into my motherboard to be an exact replica of this other hard drive. So that way, when one fails, I still have this totally redundant copy, and I didn't have to worry about anything like dropping my desktop. So a third reason might be performance. There are other ways you can configure your computer to say, I want to write half of this file to this drive and the other half of this data to this other drive. So then when I go to read that data, because I'm reading from half the data from two different sources, I can actually end up speeding up my read. So this is what the inside of a traditional HDD, or hard disk drive, looks like. So look at this in much more detail uh, next week. But up here, you see we have these three silver platters. And these platters are basically coated in this magnetic film. And this is where your data is actually stored, on these little disks. Over to the left, uh, you have this little actuator arm. And this is going to move uh, back and forth really, really quickly in order to determine where the, uh, read the data that's actually stored on those disks. So your computer also may have something called an SSD, or a solid state drive. If you have a MacBook Air, for example, the hard drive inside of that doesn't look anything like this. It's actually pretty boring, just kind of a silver little box that has flash memory, which is much like the same type of memory that's in the thumb drives that we can plug into our USB. And it's just going to end up being much faster um, than this traditional hard disk drive. But we'll see that in much more detail uh, next week. OK, so we're going to our hard drive. And now the BIOS knows exactly what it's looking for. It's looking for something, this piece of software, some code that someone wrote. It's looking for something called the kernel. And the kernel is basically one of the lowest level, one of the, uh, the closest to the hardware pieces of software on your PC. The job of the kernel, really, is to interface between some code that someone wrote and the actual hardware. 
right? So when you hit Control P or Command P in Microsoft Word, you need to start printing something. There's some piece of software that needs to actually say, OK, I'm working from my code. I need to send some data through that cable into the printer and have it print. Or if I'm in Microsoft Word again and I open a file, something needs to tell me how to get that file off of the physical hard drive that's stored on my computer and start working with it inside of a program I'm running. So that's something that's handled by the kernel. And this is a really super complicated piece of software. So we don't need to go into any more detail than this is kind of what interfaces between the, some higher level software, like a program, and the actual hardware that's powering your computer. So the execution of all of this code is going to be powered by something called a CPU. So the CPU, or processor, as you might hear, shorter, is really the brains of your computer. Right? This is really what puts the compute in computer. The processor is what's going to handle all of the operations, like the additions or accessing memory, that your computer might do. So this processor is actually operating at thousands of calculations per second, which is pretty amazing. And so you might have seen, when you're purchasing a new computer, a processor that has 2.4 gigahertz or 2.6 gigahertz. So that number is actually referring to how many calculations per second that your processor is constantly doing. So that's pretty crazy fast. So even though the CPU is actually one of the most important parts of your computer, it's also one of the smallest. So a CPU, uh, if you look over on the left-hand side, that big empty space, this is probably where your CPU is going to plug in. So you see that there are tons of small little holes, almost 1,000. These are little pins that are connected to the bottom of your CPU, and they're just going to slide right into those holes. So your CPU uh, could look something like this. Really, really small, even though it's capable of doing this incredible processing power. But really, uh, when you plug it into your motherboard, it's going to look something like this. I also have one here. So this is basically the mounting component for your CPU. It's called a heat sink. So the heat sink's job is to make sure that the CPU stays cool. So down at the bottom here, this tiny little chip, this is actually the CPU. You can see there's little tiny pins that are actually going to plug into the motherboard. So as the CPU is operating, it actually has a tendency to get really, really hot. And if that happens, then your bad things could happen. Your computer could start to overheat, uh, and things aren't going to end so well if you have a laptop on your lap. So it's really important that somehow this CPU stays cool. And so we have two ways of doing that. One, we actually have some adhesive down at the top of the CPU that keeps everything cool by dissipating the heat. We also have the more primitive fan on the top of it. So the idea of the fan is we need to make sure that the CPU in particular and the rest of the computer stays cool at all times so you don't burn your legs. So now we mentioned that we're going to load the operating system off of the hard drive. So the operating system is basically the piece of software that you're inter inter as soon as you turn on your computer, you start interacting with. So the job of the operating system is to allow you to run other software. So essentially, this is a computer program whose job is to run other computer programs, which is pretty meta. So some of the popular operating systems today that you might have heard of could be Apple's uh, OS X or OS X or Windows 8. And so even though these are two completely separate brands, question? Yeah, uh, I always thought the kernel was part of the operating system. I didn't think so. Future. Yeah. So the question is, is the kernel part of the operating system? And it is. The kernel that runs Windows is probably very different than the kernel that runs Linux or uh, OS X. Just so happens that this is the first piece of the operating system to be loaded. But you're totally right in that that software, the same people who wrote Windows 8 also wrote the Windows kernel. So they're integrated in that sense. So even though these are two different brands of operating system, and when you turn on an Apple, PC, an Apple uh, computer, it's very different than turning on a Windows PC, right? Windows happens to like their square little tiley things now, and Apple tends to like their dock at the bottom. And so really, these are just two different approaches uh, to interacting with your computer. There's nothing fundamentally different about what the Apple operating system does and what the Windows operating system does. Both just allow you to interact with new programs. But because we have these two different companies and these two different competing perspectives on how it's best to interact with your computer, we end up with these different brands. So both of these really accomplish the same goal of allowing you to run additional programs and interact with your computer. OK, so at this point, we've loaded up the operating system, and now we're good to go. Right? We have our nice icons on the desktop. We have our picture of our friend as a wallpaper. And we can start using our computer. So let's now take a step back and just kind of look at all the different components that we saw interact with each other during the startup process. So we can kind of split the motherboard uh, in half. So not literally. That would be an expensive mistake. Um, but conceptually, we have two different parts of the motherboard. At the top here, we have this thing called the North Bridge. 
And the north bridge is designed to connect all of the components that interact really frequently with the processor. So as your computer is running, it's really commonly going to need to do things like display pixels and read data from its short-term memory. So we have this dedicated controller called the north bridge. And the job of this is to coordinate the communication between the processor, who says I need to add two numbers, and memory, who says here are the two numbers that you need to add. So actually on modern CPUs, this actually isn't a separate chip on the motherboard. This is just all one uh, component. So then down here at the bottom, we have the south bridge. The job of the self bridge is to coordinate the communication between devices that may not be accessed as frequently. Right? The, the amount of time you need to display something on your screen and the number of times that you need to read data from a flash drive are probably really different. And so by splitting it up like this, this is just kind of more nicely organizes our motherboard and we can have better communication. So the job of the self bridge then is to coordinate the communication between anything in the north bridge, whether it be your CPU trying to read something from your hard drive, and then the self bridge, so everything else that's connected. So this is kind of a, a high level view of what the motherboard looks like. So now, uh, let's take a look at two components in particular uh, that are probably really essential to you using your computer every day. So the first is the keyboard. So how does the keyboard work? So your keyboard actually inside probably looks something like this. So at first I thought this was just a map of the green line given how disorganized it is. But this is actually the inside of your keyboard. And this thing is called a key matrix. So each of these uh, little black dots, it looks kind of like a, a sun, each of these is located underneath a key. And these green lines here are creating a circuit inside of your keyboard. So now whenever I press down a key, what that's going to do is it's going to complete some circuit, which basically sends some current to my keyboard's little processor. So you can actually consider the keyboard to be a little computer in and of itself. It has its own processor. It also has a little bit of memory. Somehow the computer need, the keyboard needs to actually understand, OK, if I just pressed the space bar and suddenly that, that circuit got completed, what key was just pressed? So this is stored in a component called the keyboard ROM, or read-only memory, where basically the keyboard remembers where the space bar is or where the shift key is, so that when you press it, the keyboard knows exactly what key was pressed. So then we're going to forward this along to my motherboard. To do so, I can use either a USB cable, which it's probably connected to, or some older keyboards might also be uh, connected using this thing called PS2. Uh, which isn't in really in use anymore because this USB is much better. So that's the keyboard. So how about the mouse? So the older uh, ball mice uh, work a little bit differently. They're much more mechanical. So this is kind of what the inside of a ball mouse would look like. So here we have that giant ball that if you were kind of a meddling kid uh, in school, you may have taken out of your computer lab computers and then kept so no one could use the mouse. Uh, but the way this works is that we have these two rods connected to the ball. Whenever I move the ball, these rods are going to turn. And attached to the end of these rods are these big disks. And they have small little slits inside of them. So that means whenever I move the ball, these two rods are going to rotate, and either representing either an x direction or a y direction. Because as you can see, the rods are kind of perpendicular to each other. So connected to these disks here are two tiny infrared sensors that basically send a beam of light right through that black disk. So because that disk has little slits in it, that means as the disk spins, we're going to either block that light or let that light through. So that means the faster that I'm moving the mouse, that means the faster that rod is turning and the faster the disk is moving, and the faster I'm either allowing or blocking light. And so that is how we're going to start tracking not only the direction of movement, but also the speed. So a quick video uh, makes this a little more concrete. So you can see here just a, a 3D rendering of the inside of a mouse. Let's try that again. <laughs> so here, we have a 3D rendering of the inside of a mouse. So just that makes it a little bit more concrete. You can see here that there are beams of light, and they're shining through that black disk. And as it spins, either the light is blocked or it's let through. And that's how we can know how fast we're actually moving. So let's jump back. 
So those mice aren't really too common anymore. They're kind of uh, easy to break and annoying to use because you can need like a special mouse pad. You can't use them anywhere. And so now we've started moving to optical mice. So Apple's magic mouse, as you might have seen, or really any mouse that you might buy now is optical. So the difference here is that there are no more moving components. Instead, what we have is a small laser. If you ever picked it up, and hopefully not shown it in your face, you see that a red light came out of it. And that red light, when you put it on a surface, is going to reflect back into the mouse. So what the mouse is going to do is it's going to remember the pattern that was reflected back. So if the mouse isn't moving, then we're constantly reflecting the same pattern right back into the mouse. But as soon as we start to move, that pattern is going to change. Right? We suddenly, things that were at the top were going to be at the bottom of our picture if we move the mouse up. So based on the rate at which these patterns are changing, suddenly now the mouse can figure out, am I moving left, am I moving right, or down, and how fast am I going, based on the rate of how fast these things are changing. So suddenly we don't need any more of these mechanical components, and it turns out this is actually much more accurate. Right? When you're, if you have ever seen a, like a high-performance gaming mouse, or if you're into really um, intense gaming, it's really important that the mouse is super accurate. And we can achieve this accuracy not with a little ball and these circular slits, but with lasers, which is awesome. OK, so before we break, I would just like to introduce uh, two of our staff members. Uh, so we have Ben and RJ, who are the two teaching fellows uh, for the course. So we can have them introduce themselves. I'm, I'm just going to do this. I'm RJ. I'm a junior in Winthrop House at Harvard College and um, a computer science major. I'm really excited to uh, be part of the course. I'm Ben. I'm a sophomore in Dunster House, uh, also at the college. Um, it's great to see all of you out here. I'm looking forward to teaching you, and it's going to be a great uh, semester. All right, so you'll be getting to know uh, Ben and RJ much more as the semester progresses. So right now, uh, let's just take a five-minute break. And then we'll come back and we'll learn about binary and also go over some of the course's schedule and expectations. So see you back here in about five minutes. All right, welcome back. So thanks to RJ, we actually have a motherboard here uh, that I'll pass around in just a second. But just to review everything that we just saw. So down here, remember we saw these slots, and these are where memory came out of. So that stick of memory I held up actually came out of this motherboard. So it plugs right in the slot here. You can kind of pull this apart. Uh, to get the memory out. So here is where I pil pulled the CPU out of. So you can see kind of all those tiny little slots. And then on the back here, we have all of the peripheral ports that we were just looking at. So I'm going to send this around. So feel free to uh, hold on to it. Don't worry about breaking it. This computer is already well, well destroyed. So now I just wanted to take a moment uh, to go over uh, all the different components of the course. Uh, so the first are these lectures. So lectures will be held uh, right here every Monday from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, we'll be going over uh, different topics. So these lectures uh, will be supplemented uh, by these things called recaps. So if you head to the course's website, so cse1.net. Um, we, won't really be, we won't really be using the iSite that's linked to in the Extension School website, uh, but just cse1.net is the course website if you haven't seen it already. So here, uh, with each week, we'll be posting these little uh, recaps here. So basically, these are your notes uh, for the lecture. So everything that we cover in lecture, plus maybe some other fun facts, will be here in the recaps. So feel free, uh, if you want to review lecture material or you missed something, uh, feel free to scroll through these uh, to review everything that we went over. So there'll be two or three of these for every week's lecture. So if you want to read them, uh, feel free. So in addition uh, to the two-hour lectures, we'll also be filming sections. So these sections are going to be a little bit non-traditional. So rather than uh, making you come out here again uh, for another hour each week, we're actually going to be filming these sections in a studio. And so we'll be breaking up these section videos into these little 20-minute segments. And so the idea of sections is to get some more hands-on experience or in some practical matters. So for example, next week's section will include things like taking apart a computer or doing some more examples with binary. And other sections will include things like how to use Photoshop or how to set up a Wi-Fi network at your home. So basically, these will be uh, divided up in these little 20-minute topical videos uh, that will supplement kind of the more conceptual, abstract things that we go over in lecture. And those will be led uh, by RJ and Ben. And the videos will be posted right uh, as soon as the lecture videos are posted. Uh, speaking of lecture videos, uh, they'll all be made available as soon as we possibly can. 
Uh, for better or for worse, everything I say will also be transcribed. Uh, so you can look at all the lecture transcripts. They'll be totally searchable as well as uh, translated into other languages. If uh, English isn't your first language, you prefer to do that. And so we'll debut the video player uh, as soon as the first lecture video is ready to go. Uh, so more on that very shortly. So in addition to sections, we also have weekly problem sets. And so the idea behind these problem sets is to give you some more practical questions uh, to basically apply what you learn, not only in lectures, but also in these short uh, section segments uh, and answer some questions uh, that you'll get feedback from either RJ or Ben. And we'll assign you to one of them uh, very shortly. Uh, but the problem sets are really your opportunity to apply what you've learned and hopefully solve some computer problems that you may have already run into uh, in your daily life. So those will be assigned weekly, so there'll be nine of them. Uh, the first one of those is already online. Sorry, uh, if you go to cse1.net and come over here to problem sets, uh, you'll see here uh, the first problem set's available. All submission will be electronic, um, so you can submit either a Word document or a PDF uh, using our online submission system. So speaking of that, we also have a discussion board for the course. Uh, so for everyone, uh, both during lecture and whenever you have a question at home, you can log on to the course's discussion board, uh, which you can get to by clicking on Discuss on the course website. And uh, if I can quickly log in. So you'll log in uh, using your Harvard PIN. Uh, if you don't have a Harvard HUID and PIN yet, uh, let us know by emailing staff at cse1.net, and we'll make sure that you're all set up. So after you log in uh, with your PIN, this is the discussion board. Uh, so feel free to post questions here or about the lectures. Um, during the lecture, if, you, if you're tuning in live online, uh, feel free to ask questions as well. We're going to have Ben and RJ actually manning the discussion board so that we can actually answer the questions you have as you're tuning in live uh, online. So in addition, if it's 3 in the morning and the problem set's due the next day and you're just kind of stuck, feel free to post a question here and answer each other's posts, uh, as well as uh, learn. Uh, that's it. <laughs> so as well. so uh, post questions. So weekly, uh, we also have, as the syllabus mentions, we have uh, somewhat weekly current events posts. So throughout the course, we're going to be covering a variety of topics, so hardware, internet. And as you are browsing the tech news, maybe CNN or just other tech news site, you might find that suddenly you're, all of these stories are starting to make a lot more sense to you. And so no, the goal of this is, is now is for at least five times throughout the semester for you to post on Discuss showing us some story you found, maybe briefly what the news story said, what you found most interesting. You can post that here on Discuss using this label over here, current events. And so feel free to read each other's posts and just share cool stories in general. Um, so as long as you have at least five throughout the semester, it'll be good to go. If you head to the uh, syllabus, there are some guidelines. Basically saying, you know, we just want between 200 and 500 words. And then here are a bunch of links uh, to help you get started. So if you're interested in learning more about Macs or startups in the tech community or just technology in general, um, these are some good places to get started. Uh, so don't feel like you have to only read news articles, uh, uh, printed text. Feel free to comment on videos or interactive things you found online or really anything else uh, that you found interesting that's relevant uh, to some topic we covered each week. And so hopefully this can be a fun way of getting you more up to speed with the latest and greatest or things that you may have seen uh, before and now make a whole lot more sense. So the course also has two exams. Uh, the dates are listed in the syllabus. And the exams are going to cover uh, weeks one through four for the first exam and then weeks five through nine. Uh, for the second exam. So they will take place in lieu of lecture. So they'll be right here um, at the same date and time, so 5.30 to 7.30. Um, if you are, don't live in the New England area, if you go to cse1.net slash proctors, uh, we have the information from the Extension School uh, regarding how to set up a taking a distance exam. So no worries if you can't make it to campus for the exam. So the course also has a final project, which is kind of the culmination of everything you've learned in CSE1. And in the final project, you'll actually get in the opportunity to design and host your very own website that can be dedicated to a topic of your choice. Um, but using what the technologies we'll learn in weeks eight and nine, uh, we'll be able to create almost any website you want and show it to your family and friends uh, via our own hosting account. So more to come much later on the final project, um, but you might want to start thinking about what cool website you want to make now. 
So the course is divided into four parts. So the first, these first two weeks, as you've seen, are going to focus on hardware. So if you flip to the syllabus, you can follow along with me on page four. So this is lecture one. We've covered about half of these topics. Next week, uh, we'll be taking a look at hardware components specifically, basically how the CPU works, how RAM works, and some other more focused topics about hardware. After that, uh, we'll be watching a movie, Pirates of Silicon Valley, which is an awesome movie about the early days of Microsoft and Apple. Uh, and it's very dramatic and very fun to watch. And so hopefully that will start to make a whole lot more sense to you as they say words like motherboard and BIOS um, that suddenly you're like, wow, I know what that is. Awesome. So after that, uh, it's President's Day, so we won't have uh, any lecture then. And after that, we're going to shift from hardware to the internet. So your favorite procrastination mechanism We'll cover things in the first week, uh, basically internet foundations. So how your computer connects to a network, what things like IP addresses are. And then in the following week, we're going to kind of fill in the gaps at both a high level and a low level. So how things like Ethernet works and how packets are actually sent from your computer to some website, as well as more high level protocols. So what we mean when we make an HTTP request or, some, or move something to an FTP server. So then uh, we have our first exam that will cover uh, hardware and the internet topics. After that, uh, we have spring break, uh, so we will not have lecture that week. And then we're going to move into security. Uh, so following the first lecture, we'll take a brief detour into multimedia. And we'll learn about, things, uh, how, learn about things like how graphics editing works or how streaming video works. And we'll have fun assignments like making your own pictures. Uh, up next is then security. So in this first week, we're going to talk about threats to your security, things like scary words that you might have heard, like viruses and Trojan horses and spyware and worms. So we'll learn all about uh, what all of that means. And then the following week, I'll be focusing on how we can protect your privacy with some defenses. So things like firewalls and antivirus software and encryption and how all of that works to keep your computer safe uh, from viruses. So finally, uh, we're going to move into software development uh, and web development in particular. So we'll learn about how to make a website and what goes into making a website. And so that includes topics like HTML and CSS, which if you've ever, you may have done before, we'll learn, uh, look at that much more in depth. And then finally, in the final week, uh, we'll look at programming. So we'll use a program called Scratch, which you may have heard of, but it basically allows us to express computer programs and formal computer logic using these nice puzzle pieces and actually building blocks. So combining uh, both web development and programming, you can start making these really cool interactive websites uh, that you can be hosted on the internet with your own domain name uh, if you want that you can show to family and friends. So any questions on anything logistic before we start moving into this? OK. So you may have heard somewhere that your computer is all about zeros and ones. And so as this slide suggests, this, we're now going to learn what those zeros and ones actually mean. So first, we need to look at why zero and one. I mean, we have a bunch of other digits, like three and seven, but our computer instead decides to use only zeros and ones. So let's start uh, with a question. The question is, do you like cats? I know everyone's answer is yes, but there really are only two possible answers to this question, either yes or no. So this is what's called a binary state. There are two different states we can have. We can like cats, yes, I do like cats, or we can not like cats. So anything that can be expressed using one or two states can be expressed using binary. So we could represent an answer of yes, I like cats, with the number one. And we can represent an answer of no, I do not like cats, which makes me sad, with, an, with a number zero. So similarly, we might use something like true or false, or something uh, more concrete, like is this light on or off? So inside of our computer, we might represent a 1 by flipping something on. On the other hand, we can represent a 0 by flipping something off. So this is what we mean when we say something is binary. There are just two possible values that it can have. So before we delve more into binary, let's first remember, or sorry, so instead a different question is something like this. So how much do you like cats? Suddenly, this is not a binary question anymore. There are multiple answers to this question. There could be, I like them a lot, I don't like them at all, I kind of like them, I really love them. So suddenly, this one or a zero is not enough. 
Instead, we need to somehow be able to express uh, this whole range of values, but still only using a 0 or a 1. So as far as our computer is concerned, we can only represent something as on or off. So before we do that, let's first uh, take a look at how we are probably used to representing numbers. So in grade school, when we were learning to count, and we learned how to rep, you know, write down numbers like 123. We may have used these things here, uh, these base 10 blocks, I think they're called. And basically, each of these small cubes represents something in the ones place. One of these columns is something in the tens place. One of these big rectangles is something in the hundreds place, and so on. And so we learned that when we write down a number with different digits, we write down something like this. So each of the digits in a number is a different place. We have the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place. So if we write down the number 1, 2, 3, what that is equal to is 1 times 100 plus 2 times 10 plus 3 times 1. Right? We're all used to how we're writing down numbers. So using this, I'm going to make one small change to how we represent numbers. I'm going to take this 1,000, 100, 10, and 1, and I'm going to do this. Suddenly, rather than having a tens place, we now have a twos place. Instead of having a hundreds place, we have a fours place. So where did these numbers come from? Well, that 1,000 happened to represent 10 times 10 times 10, or 10 to the third power. That 100 is 10 to the second power. 10 is 10 to the first power, and 1 is 10 to the zeroth power. So instead of using 10 as my base and keep doing stuff with that 10, I'm instead going to use 2 as my base. So 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and so on. So let's try counting in binary. So the number 0 is really, really easy to represent. We're just going to represent 0 with a 0. So similarly, if we want to represent the number 1, we can do so. Because we have two digits. We have a 0 and a 1. So that means I can represent the number 1 with just a 1. But now we want to try to represent 2. And that's going to get a little bit tricky. Because suddenly we only have two digits, and 2 wasn't one of those digits. So now, in order to represent the number 2, I'm going to do something like this. So we, have, we're, we don't have our zero, we have our ones place, and rather than a tens place, we have a twos place. So suddenly, if I have a number like one zero, this is actually going to represent the number two. Why is that? Well, if I have a one in the twos place, and I have a zero in the ones place, that means I have two plus zero. And that's going to be equal to two. So let's jump back. In order now to go from a 2 to a 3, we now want to have, I want to have a 2, and I want to have one more than that 2. So to make that 3, I'm going to need 1, 2, and 1, 1. So the number 3 in binary can be expressed as 1, 1. We have 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1, which is simply saying 2 plus 1, which is 3. So how could we represent the number 4? In binary? One, zero, zero. Exactly, so 100. Zero, zero. So remember that once we were going, making the jump from 2 to 3, we needed to make some new digit. So running into the same problem here, both of our digits are already a 1, so we really can't make this number any big bigger. So we need to introduce a space for a new digit. And to do that, we can simply say 100. Zero, zero. And so this is the number 4. So let's just make sure. If I have 1, 0, 0, that means I have a 4. I don't have any 2s. I don't have any 1s. So that's just equal to the number 4. So let's do one more. So everyone think for a second what 5 in binary is. Don't say it yet. Anyone want to hazard a guess to what 5 is? Yeah, so 101. Exactly. So we, ha we don't need a new digit anymore because we have some zeros. So if we just add 1, Suddenly, we have 1, 4, we don't have any 2s, and we have 1, 1, which added together makes 5. So 5 is 101, or 1, 0, 1 in binary. So uh, rather than counting, uh, let's try somewhat of a bigger number. So here's a binary number, and we want to figure out what this binary number represents in decimal. So to do that, I just want to fill in my table. So I have the 2 to the 0 place, which is 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, and 16s. So now I can just draw this in. So now it's time for me to convert this sequence of bits to a number. So to do that, all I say is this. 
I have one 16. I don't have any 8s. I have a 4. I have a 2. And I don't have any 1s. So this is the same as saying this. I have 16 plus 0 plus a 4 plus a 2 plus a 0. So if we add this all up, we get the number 22. So that means that that series of zeros and ones represented a 22. So each of these zeros and ones are something that we call a bit. So a bit is essentially the smallest amount of information that we can represent. Right? There's not really anything smaller than we can represent than the difference between 0 and 1. So each of these zeros and ones inside of this binary sequence is called a bit. So uh, very frequently, when you're looking at binary numbers, you won't see uh, simply all ones. You might usually see it prefixed with a 0. So rather than writing something like 111, we may write 0111. So notice that adding a 0 to the beginning of a binary number doesn't do anything, right? Because that's just going to be the equivalent of adding 0. So we can add as many zeros as we want to the beginning of a binary number. We're not actually going to change its value. So we're going to take some number, we're going to keep on adding 0. No matter how hard we try, we're not going to change the value of that binary number. So sometimes you might see a binary number expressed as 011 or 0b111, and that just indicates that this is a binary number. So we know the difference between 111 and the binary representation of that. So let's now try going the other way. So let's say we have some decimal number, and we want the binary representation of it. So the way of going from decimal to binary is much like making change at a cash register. So if you're at a cash register and someone's total comes to $20.50 and they give you $21, you want to make change for that using as few coins as you possibly can. So not only do you not want to aggravate your customer by giving them 50 pennies, you also don't want to aggravate your manager who doesn't want you to give away all of the pennies the cash register has. So you want to be as conservative as you can. So at any opportunity, you want to use the largest coin you possibly can. Right? If I need to make change for 51 cents, and I can use two quarters, I want to use as many quarters as I possibly can until suddenly giving one more quarter will be giving them too much change, which is arguably worse. So let's say we have a number like this. We have the number 14. And we say, what is the binary representation of this number? So what we want to do is start off with the same little table that we started off with before. So we have the ones, twos, fours, et cetera places. So let's start all the way to the left. So if we start in the 16s place, if we put a 1 there, then suddenly we've given someone 16 cents when they've asked for 14. That's already way too much. And there's nothing we can do later to take that, much, to take that money away. So that means we really shouldn't put a 1 in this first place, because we know that our answer cannot be right. So that means the first number here is going to be a 0. OK, so let's move on to the next place. So now we have 8. So we have a coin that represents 8 cents. And we're trying to make 14 cents. So if I give you an 8 cent coin, that's not going to be too much. And I know that I want to be as conservative as possible. I don't want to give you more coins than I have to. So if I can give you an 8 cent coin, I'm going to. So that means that in this place, we want this to be a 1. Because we want to use this slot if we possibly can. So now. We had our number 14, and we just gave away 8 cents. So that means we have to make 6. So moving on to our next place, we have 2 to the 2, which is 4. So if I'm trying to make 6 cents, and I have a 4 cent coin, that's good. Because that means that I can give you a 4 cent coin. I'm not going to give you too much. So we want to put a 1 right there. So that means that we've given you 12 cents so far, which means we need to give you 2 more cents. Well, right now, I'm at the 2's place. So if I give you that 2 cents, that means that suddenly I've given you all of the change that I have to give you. So that means I don't want to give you anything from the 1's place because you're already done, which means that this can be a 0. So any questions on how we just did that? Yeah? Sure. So let's, so let's start here. So right now, we have 2 to the 3, and that's going to be 8. right? So we have 14 minus 8, and that's going to leave us with 6. So now we're at 2 to the 2, and that's 4. 
So we went from six cents, now we can give you four more, now you have two cents left. So now we're at two to the one, and now we can give you two cents, so we've given you all of your change. So at each step, we basically subtracted how many cents we just gave you based on whether or not we put a one or a zero in that place. So now if we take this binary sequence here and we try to convert back, we know we have eight plus four is 12, plus two is 14, plus zero is still 14. Other questions? OK. So let's try something else. Let's try adding up two binary numbers. So let's say we have these two binary numbers here, and we want to compute the sum. So one naive way to do this would be to figure out, all right, well, what's this value in decimal? What's this value in decimal? Question first? Sure. Sure. So in, in our example here, do we have to put this 0 all the way to the right as a placeholder? So in this case, we do. right? If we didn't have a 0 here, that would mean that the first digit was a 1. And suddenly, rather than being the 2's place, that's now the 1's place. So if we drop this 0, suddenly this is a different number. On the other hand, all the way to the left, that's a different story. Yeah, we do not need that, because all this number on the left is doing is it's just saying, I'm going to add 0 to my total. So Different, uh, so we can add as many as we want on the left, but not as many as we want on the right. Questions? OK. So let's add these two numbers together. So luckily, we can add binary numbers in really the same way that we're used to adding decimal numbers. So first, we can start off with an easy one. We'll start all the way to the right, just like we did in grade school. So 1 plus 0 is 1. So we can really easily fill in the value 1 here. So the next one's a little more challenging. What is 1 plus 1? 2. So 1 plus 1 is 2. And how do we represent a 2 in binary? 1, 0. Exactly. So if this were grade school and suddenly these two values added up to something like 10 or 23, remember what we do? What do we do? Yeah, we have to carry the 1. So we have 1 plus 1 is 2, so I'm going to write down a 0 carry the 1. So suddenly now we're in our next spot. We have 1 plus 1 again. So what do we do? 0 and carry the 1. So finally, we're left with an easy one. What's this? What's my first digit now? 1, exactly. So we have 1 plus 0 plus 0, which is 1. So this is the sum of those two binary numbers. Make sense? Yeah? Can you explain the third column here? Sure. So, the thir so what we did is we said 1 plus 0 is 1. So in the second column, we had to say 1 plus 1 is 2. So in binary, that's like saying it is a 0, carry the 1. So suddenly we carried this 1. We want to add that on to the next column now. So suddenly. Right. So we're saying that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 to the power of 1, because that's 2. So normally, we'd express the number 2 with just a 1 followed by a 0. So we're just kind of doing that here. We wrote down a 0, and now we carry the 1. Just like when we regularly add, we can, if we have the number 12, we write down the 2, and we carry the 1. And so it works the same way in binary, even though it looks a little bit different. Other questions on how we got here? OK. So now, uh, hopefully jokes uh, like this can make some more sense. <laughs> so, if you, yeah, so the joke here is there, there are 10 types of people. 10 in binary is what number? 2. So there are really two types of people. If you're grown in because you've already heard this before, uh, we have the more, sar the more sarcastic. There are 10 types of people, those who know binary and those who have friends. Oh. OK. So now we've seen how computers can represent numbers. But usually when we're working with a computer, we represent much more than numbers, right? We want to start representing the letters we type on our keyboard. Remember, the computer is still fundamentally zeros and ones. So what we need to do is figure out a way to translate from these zeros and ones 
into something that we can actually represent, that is actually helpful to represent, like a letter. So I have here, uh, to introduce this, a clip from the movie Wanted. So this is 2008 uh, with Morgan Freeman uh, explaining binary. But to deliver. Every culture in history has a secret code, one you won't find in traditional texts. A thousand years ago, a clan of weavers discovered a mystical language hidden in the fabric. They called themselves the fraternity. I'll be honest with you, all I see are threads. Come here. Look there. You see that one thread that missed the weave and lies on top of the others? Like a mistake? No, it's a coat. If the vertical thread is on top, it's a one. If it's below, it's a zero. Binary code? What does it say? It's a name. A target. So unfortunately, our binary will not be as dramatic uh, as that. But what just happened here is Morgan Freeman, who can, if he cannot explain binary, then I don't know who can, uh, was looking at a series of bits. So some of those bits were ones, and some of them were zeros. And suddenly from that, he got uh, some name. And that name happened to be the this next assassination target, which we definitely won't be doing here. Um, so from those zeros and ones, he got that name. So to do that, that means he had to have some kind of encoding, some way of going from zeros and ones to a name. So we encounter some encodings uh, pretty frequently. So if you've ever uh, been on a ship, you might have seen something like this. So this is one encoding that we have that maps something to characters. So here we have a series of flags. And each of these flags represents a different letter. So if a ship wants to communicate some message, it can't simply send letters over to another ship, because that just doesn't make sense. So instead, it needs to have some way of encoding its message using something it can send. So the ship does have flags, so the ship can use flags to start sending a message. So here, whenever we see, for example, this flag with the yellow cross, we know that that's going to represent the letter R. So we've encoded that letter R as this flag. So another type of encoding you might have seen before is this. So this is Morse code. So we, in order to send, for example, the letter Z, I want to send some pattern of sounds that looks like this. And now we have someone on the other end who's going to hear these pattern of sounds, and they're going to have to know how to translate that to a letter. So that means that we've created some mapping, some encoding that maps these series, this sound pattern to an actual letter. So in computers, we're actually going to take the same exact approach. While we're not going to use flags or sounds, else that would be annoying and probably take up a lot of space, we're going to use something called ASCII. So ASCII is a character encoding that defines encodings for 128 different characters. So for example, if I want to encode the uh, letter capital A in ASCII, a computer doesn't know what a capital A is. But we've seen that a computer does know how to represent numbers, because we can simply use that binary sequence of zeros and ones. So to represent the letter A, I can instead say, whenever I see the number 65, that's going to refer to an A, or a capital A to be specific. So that means that if I want to represent an A, I'm just going to use the number 65 everywhere. My computer has this mapping from numbers to letters that's shared across all different computers. They all know that this 65 corresponds to a capital A. So in the same way, the number 97 was chosen to represent the letter lowercase a. So whenever we see a number 97, we're actually referring instead to a lowercase a. So here. Uh, is a large mapping of the ASCII encoding. So this is called the ASCII table. We can see here that in the red is the character that we'd like to encode. And then all the way over to the left is the decimal representation of that number. So W, for capital W, for example, we can see is an 87. So there's no need to commit this to memory, because I certainly haven't. Um, but this is the most basic of mappings between some characters and some numbers, which really are just sequences of bits. So let's look at an example. So let's say I'm a computer, and I want to represent this text, cs space e hyphen 1. So to do that, I need to figure out what the ASCII code for each of these letters is. I want to take some letter, 
and turn it into a number using this same mapping that everybody knows. So by going back and forth on that ASCII table, I figured out that CS space E-1 is represented by this series of numbers. So now, if I'm a computer, I still don't know what the digit 6 is. I can only work in binary. So really, in order to represent this message, the computer will do something like this. So this first value here is a 67, and the second value is whatever the ASCII code for S, capital S, happened to be. But now, suddenly we're representing text using only zeros and ones. So this is nice, um, but we said that ASCII only defines uh, something like 128 different characters. That's actually pretty limited compared to the number of characters on your keyboard. So we have other encodings as well that kind of build on top of ASCII. So one of these is called UTF-8. You may have heard this you know, on a web page or if you've ever downloaded a Word file and got some, some weird error message. But what UTF-8 does is it allows us to define additional characters that aren't simply letters. So one of my favorite uh, Unicode characters is this, which is a snowman. So this is not actually just a picture of a snowman. This is actually the Unicode character snowman. And if you go to a site, uh, Unicode snowman for you, you can see here that this, now I'm in a web browser, and this is actually a character that if I take my mouse and I highlight it, I can copy and paste a snowman into my address bar. Because this isn't an image. This is actually a character that's represented now with UTF-8, which is just rather than this ASCII table that could fit on the slide, is this huge table of really anything you might ever want to represent. Um, so another one of those characters uh, that is represented in Unicode uh, but not ASCII is this, which is called the Unicode Love Hotel. It's actually someone took the time to not only draw this, but to put it into the Unicode standard so that if you ever needed to type a Unicode Love Hotel, you can do so without having to resort to an image. So if you go to, for example, unicodelovehotel.com, you will get just this character in case you ever need to use it. But the point of this really is that ASCII isn't enough, right? I mean, so not only do we need to represent snowmen and hotels, but we might also want to represent something like accented characters or the pound sign or anything else that's not simply a letter. So it's actually somewhat necessary in that sense, in that you know, just typing letters on a keyboard probably isn't enough to express everything we want. And UTF-8, the goal of this is to really take everything ever we could possibly want to type and represent it somehow, still using only zeros and ones. Suddenly, though, we just have this small mapping of numbers to characters. We have this huge mapping of really big numbers to kind of silly characters. So any questions there? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So ASCII, we saw, it defines numbers. So let's flip back to our ASCII table. So we said that we want to make sure, what if we wanted to represent the number 6, 7 in ASCII? So if we look at our ASCII table, it looks like the number 6 is actually represented by the ASCII code 54. And so that's how your computer ensures that it's not confusing. When, you're, when your computer is given some block of data, we have to tell that computer what this block of data is encoded as. So if we have this string, we tell our computer this is an ASCII string, suddenly it knows that all of the data that inside of that message is actually ASCII, and it's no longer actual characters. So by specifying what encoding we want to use, which is something that your computer is just going to do transparently and uh, not to your knowledge, that's how we can start to jump um, from the number 67, for example, to the ASCII code uh, for capital C. Other questions on character encodings? So if you actually visit a website, um, and you, as we'll do soon, we'll like, we can look at the source code of that website or the code that was written in order to create the website. Really frequently at the top, we'll see something like encoding equals UTF-8. And that is one way uh, that your computer is guaranteed to know which of these encodings to use. Luckily, UTF-8 is actually built on top of ASCII. So the ASCII representation for A and the Unicode representation for A are the same, uh, which worked out really nicely uh, so we can minimize confusion among people and computers. OK, 
So storing data as zeros and ones is nice, but suddenly, if we have some really big numbers, and suddenly we have two or four gigabytes of data, uh, which is a lot, we don't really want to know how many bits it is. Because it's going to turn out that it's a whole lot of bits to store something like a music file. So instead, we start to refer to these in larger and larger quantities. So our smallest quantity that we talked about was a bit. And the bit was either a 0 or a 1. If we take 8 bits now, a sequence of 8 bits that are all part of the same uh, representation of data, we're going to call that sequence of 8 bits a single byte. So by the way, if you take 4 bits instead of 8, it's not a byte, it's a nibble. That is actually the technical term, albeit clever. So now suddenly we have 8 bits, and that's equal to 1 byte. So that's still a really, really small amount of information. In fact, that's still you know, on the order of a single ASCII character. So now if you want to represent more than a byte, we can start adding these prefixes. So a kilobyte, for example, is equal to 1,000 bytes. A, gigab a megabyte is 1,000 kilobytes. A gigabyte, as you might expect, is 1,000 megabytes, and so on and so forth. So when we say your computer has between 2 and 4 gigabytes of RAM, that means we actually have a whole lot of bits, because we're, basically, we're multiplying each of these steps by 1,000. So your hard drive, on the other hand, which has between uh, a gig a several hundred gigabytes and maybe several terabytes, that is even more bits. But to say that your hard drive has 11 billion bits isn't really that helpful, so we want to compress that down into terabytes. So any questions? OK. So before we finish up, I want to introduce something that we'll be covering uh, a little bit later in the course, and that is thinking like a computer. And a computer is going to solve problems very methodically. And it's also going to solve problems maybe in a different way than you might expect. So if I ask you a question like this, what chair is everyone sitting in? So to answer this question, everyone might take the time and say, I want to look to my left, and I'm going to count. One, two, three, four, five, the number of chairs that is to my left. So that's nice, and it's going to eventually give ourselves the right answer. But it's not very efficient. right? Suddenly, we have all of these different people, each separately taking the time to count left. One, two, three, four, five. And we can speed this up a little bit. We can count by twos. We can say two, four, six, eight. But still, we have everyone in a room doing the same exact thing to get some correct answer. So I'm going to propose a different way to solve this problem. So rather than everyone independently counting where they sit, we're going to do something like this. So each person can say, I want to look to the person to my left, and I want to ask, what seat are you sitting in? So now, if there is no one to your left, I'm going to say 1. The next step is to say, I want to add 1 to the answer of the person to my left and say it out loud. So let's see what happens when we run this. So in our front row here, we have Ben, RJ, and Lexi. And so if you guys would like to execute this computer program, what happens? So we'll start with Ben, and we'll move that way. One, two, three. OK, that was close, though we didn't actually follow the program. <laughs> so the goal, so if you're a computer, remember, we need to actually execute every step in order. So even though it might be a little pedantic, we need to actually take the time and execute every step. So if we want to start, OK. So we'll just, so we'll just stay there, but make sure we actually, rather than just saying one, we need to actually ask. So this is to your right, sorry. So to your right now, you want to, OK. So you want to ask all the way to your right and see what happens. So now let's try again. If Ben starts. So there we go. So this was a little bit different. Suddenly, not all three of them were counting the chairs to their left. Instead, each person did one small step. They said, I'm going to simply ask the person to my left. And so when I've done that, I've taken this larger problem. I need to count this really large quantity. And I've broken it down into a smaller problem. Rather than counting all these chairs, I'm just going to ask a simple question. So now suddenly, if everyone starts to do this, this problem gets progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? In fact, it gets one chair smaller with every direction we go to the left. Till at the end, this last person can come up with an answer for themselves. And now, once this one person has an answer, we can start to propagate that back to the original person. And so in some computer science, we call this recursion. 
And so in the process of recursion, we take a big problem, like the problem we just had, and we break it up into somehow a smaller problem. And now you'll notice that I didn't have separate instructions for Ben and RJ. Ben and RJ actually followed the exact same set of instructions. Yet, when they executed them, it turned out a little bit differently. Right? Somehow Ben got the answer 3 and RJ got the answer 2. So I didn't need to tell them anything different, but I saved them a lot of time. So it turns out that if we had all counted individually, that problem would have looked something uh, like a quadratic, so a curve that goes really kind of skyrockets up. Where now, if we do this instead, each person, rather than doing counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, suddenly it looks more like a line, which is much, much more efficient. And so this is just one way of taking some problem and thinking about it not only very formally, but also in a more efficient way, and something you might not expect. And so when later we write um, computer programs, we can feed them things like this, this very specific set of instructions that, unlike Ben and RJ, will listen to them, that when you formalize them very nicely, we can start to get answers that are much more efficient than trying to do things uh, ourselves. So any last questions? Yeah. Sure, so what do we mean when we say binary? Yeah, so also ASCII. So we, the best way to describe binary is how we represent data. So if we have some quantity, like the number 20, we can represent that in a number of ways. I could give you two dimes and say that's 20. I could also write down the number did digit 2 followed by the digit 0, and I can say that's 20. So another way of representing 20 uh, might be the binary representation, which is just some way to interpret the quantity 20. So ASCII is a little bit different. It's kind of a layer on top of that. So ASCII also is a representation of data. So somehow when I give you the letter A, I want to represent that somehow. And I can represent that with the ASCII encoding of that letter. So ASCII kind of builds on top of binary and uses binary in order to express things that aren't simply numbers or zeros and ones. Other questions? Sure, so the question is, is, why is binary used in computers? So back when we were talking about how the computer turned on, we had all of these different electrical components, and they're all connected via these circuits. And so as far as the electrical components are concerned, it's really easy to represent on or off. So whether there is electricity flowing through something, or whether electricity is not flowing through something, or whether a light is on or whether a light is off. So at the really low level electrical component level, that's how we can represent either a 0 or a 1 in actual physical hardware. So because that's how the hardware works, we, the hardware can either do a 0 or a 1, which is kind of this light or electricity. That's when we just say, OK, well, given this limitation of our hardware, that we can use a 0 or a 1, let's start to build on top of that in order to somehow get from that really low level kind of meaningless distinction to suddenly this, the things that power cat videos. Other questions? OK, well, I'll be available uh, if you have any questions about the course or any of today's material. Um, but if not, then we'll see you next week.